case on our docket is City of Fernandina Beach v. Conti. Counsel for the appellant. Good morning, Your Honor. David Shelton and Doug Brown on behalf of the city. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. May it please the court. This is an appeal from a non-final order certifying a class of persons and entities who paid impact fees to the city from 2003 up until the present. In our brief, we have raised three fundamental issues that we'd like the court to address. And if time permits, I'd like to address those this morning. First of all, we've raised the issue that Ms. Conlon lacks standing to assert this claim. Secondarily, that she's not an appropriate class representative. And thirdly, that the class definition is too broadly defined to include people all the way back from 2003. With respect to standing, all the parties have agreed, even the trial court agreed, that standing was a threshold issue that had to be resolved up front. And the case law indicates that this is an issue that this court reviews de novo. And with respect to her standing, this is a situation where Ms. Conlon filed her suit in 2011. And that was eight years after the ordinance was enacted, which allowed the city to charge these impact fees. It was also more than six years. So is the standing issue really a statute of limitations issue? Well, there is that in there. It's certainly been discussed as a statute of limitations issue. It's been discussed as a latches issue as well. Because with respect to her individually, she bought her property in 2005, and she waited for six years before bringing her action. And she wants to say that her claim is for declaratory relief. And under the law, there was no provision for her to have filed that lawsuit for declaratory relief back in 2005. And since she purchased her property in 2005, that was two years after the ordinance was enacted. So if this- But even before she applies for a building permit, in your view, she has a cause of action? She had an ability to sue for declaratory relief, just like everyone who's part of the class that owned property that had been undeveloped back in 2003 had such a cause of action. Any one of these people who are part of the putative class action could have, and owned the property back in 2003, could have filed suit for declaratory relief before paying the impact fees. Absolutely. And that's fundamentally part of the problem that we see here, is that you've got a situation where people either owned the property for a number of years and never brought a challenge, or they have paid the fee back in 2003, 2004, 2005, and 2006. And we have hundreds of those people, but none of them ever brought a challenge. And so it's not until eight years after the ordinance is enacted, eight years after these impact fees have been collected, that someone comes in and says, I paid it two years ago. I shouldn't have paid it. And not only do I want a refund, but I think everybody who's paid since 2003 is entitled to a refund. And the appellee's theory is that the statute of limit, the timing of the statute of limitations and the cause of action don't accrue until she actually pays the fee. And is there any case law regarding a city impact fee or user fee that uses that measure to determine the statute of limitations? No. And what we have focused in on and what we've tried to suggest to the court is that for purposes of the statute of limitations, they want to say that their claim is an as applied claim. But if you look at what they're really doing, they're attacking the impact fee ordinance fundamentally and on its face. So they don't have an as applied claim as that really means. I mean, if you look at the case law dealing with as applied claims and impact fees, it really goes to the question of am I as a property owner getting a benefit from it in the sense that we've got cases where they were in a type of community where the impact fee was for schools. And it was an over 55 adult community and they didn't have kids there so they weren't getting any benefits. So they said that was an as applied challenge. But here she's saying that everyone from 2003 up to the present falls into the same category. So she's not making an as applied. But that's what the court latched on to to get to the point where they said this class can be defined this broadly. And there isn't any case law that supports that. 
It's not an as-applied challenge. It's not a situation where she had to wait to pay it. I mean, that's the fundamental problem that we see is that she didn't have to wait. She didn't have to incur this quote-unquote injury. As a matter of fact, the existence of the ordinance was there. The impact on the property was already there when she purchased the property. She should have known that when she purchased the property that she couldn't develop it without paying the impact fees. And even if we agreed with the argument that the accrual of the cause of action is when the fee is paid, that would still exclude all of the fee payers from 2003 all the way up to 2007, four years before the lawsuit was filed. Is that correct? Certainly. If this court adopts the as-applied theory as suggested, it would only go back so far as 2007. So you're talking about lots of people who are included in the class who shouldn't be there. And that in and of itself would be reason to send back the order for revision of the definition of the class. Fundamentally, yes. We think at the very least the class is defined too broadly to include those people who paid in 2003 and never did anything to challenge it, whether it's four years or five years. They never did anything, and so we think those people are barred, absolutely. We think at the very least you should reverse on that basis, send it back for redetermination of the class definition. And then on the alternative ground on the, you know, just attacking the facial validity of the ordinance, aren't there issues involving fraudulent concealment, fraud, estoppel that would preclude class treatment for this particular class? What's your argument there? Well, certainly their view is that the equitable estoppel, which is what the trial court ultimately found, and it's really the only theory that the appellees are calling or pursuing in front of this court. They have dropped in their brief at page 37, they have dropped any specific reliance upon fraudulent concealment. And although they argued equitable tolling below, the trial court found against them on that issue, and they have not challenged that ruling up here. So it only goes to the equitable estoppel, and as I understand it, the equitable estoppel is only important to the appellees to the extent they're trying to get these early people, these early payers into the class. And you're right, if you, the only way they are able to do it is to suggest that there is some equitable estoppel, and as the case law is clear, and even as the trial judge found, and as the appellees concede in their brief, you have to have reliance in order to pursue that doctrine. And our view is that under the case law dealing with reliance, that that's an individual issue. You know, what did each individual property owner review or see or hear, and how did they individually rely upon it? So you're right, that's not an issue that's appropriate for class treatment. So I think that's a secondary argument to get rid of those pre-2007 issues. I mean, it's not necessary to Ms. Conlon to pursue that. She's pursuing based upon four years, so she's not relying upon that. That really is a doctrine that was asserted just to protect those 2003 to 2007 people. But we think that that doctrine shouldn't apply to them as a matter of law, and we think even if the doctrine could be pursued, it shouldn't be pursued as a class action. So we think the 2003 to 2007 people. Why is that? Because if you look at equitable estoppel, why couldn't you apply the principles of equitable estoppel to all members of the purported class? Because equitable estoppel as an element has a statement by the government or by the party that's relied upon detrimentally by the party asserting the equitable estoppel. And so you have to have each person coming in and saying, this is what was told to me, this is what I heard, this is what I read, and this is how I individually relied upon it. And we don't have any of those facts for Mrs. Conlon. I mean, she's the only one who's been deposed, and she testified with respect to her own individual claim. She never went to any of these meetings. She never read any of these ordinances or resolutions or documents before the lawsuit was filed. So she didn't have any ability to rely on them or not to rely on them. Her position really is that the ordinances and resolutions were set up in such a way that she couldn't understand her claim. She couldn't understand that she had a claim, but that's not promissory estoppel. Under the case law, it's got to be that the government said something 
that dissuaded me from filing suit. And here she's saying she, she didn't get any statement from the government. She just didn't know she had a claim. And in, fa in fact, doesn't the record reflect that there were a number of developers, not you know, individual landowners, who paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in these impact fees? And wouldn't there be a different standard for demonstrating reliance for those types of um, fee payers versus the landowner who pays one impact fee? Certainly, our, our view is that those people would certainly have more incentive to go to the meeting. They'd have more incentive to view these documents. They'd have more incentive to have their own engineers look at these things. We don't have any record of that because that wasn't developed below. But, but we, cer certainly, certainly we certainly agree that that's true, that those people would look at it differently and would have a different understanding of these, these mm -hmm. documents, and they would look at it differently. And, we'd have and to isn't the that. difference also that those those developers were paying that fee time <coughs> and time and time again, and not just one time? So had multiple occasions to consider, you know, whether the fee was appropriate to challenge the fee. So is, aren't they in a different position than that landowner who pays it once? They are very. Uh, that's that's absolutely our position. That they're very different positions, and we think that not only means that you know the class is not appropriate, but it also. Re reinforces our reliance upon Frederick. I mean, Frederick was a situation where they said from a public policy perspective, we think once the, once the city government or, or once any government decides upon some long range financing and they, they, they look at it from a strategic perspective that we want them to be cut off within four years of those challenges. And certainly those land developers who paid in 2003 and 2004 and paid lots and lots of money they were in a position where they could have done that. They could have come in and said, we're, we're being forced to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars, but, but, but they didn't the do that. But the situation in Frederick very different because in Frederick, once they adopted the, 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 the financing plan, they taxed it less, so the, and the tax immediately became a, became a lien or applicable to the property. So it's logical that, that, that the adoption of that should be the starting point where here there was no tax imposed on the property. There was a there was a, a fee imposed when you start a building program. So I think it, that there's that difference in fact that seems to me to be pretty important. Well, we suggest that it's not. It, it, it's certainly um, a difference, but we don't think it's significant in the sense that once the ordinance was passed, any undeveloped land within the city was subject to these impact fees. And so whether whether you got that as a as a tax lien or whether or not you did the research, you went to the meetings, you looked at the ordinance that were applicable, you certainly could have done that. It, in, the, in, in the briefing, it really comes, it, what the appellees are suggesting is that that is a difference as to the level of notice. And we certainly think everything was done here in the public, um, public meetings, public ordinance, um, all these documents were available through public records requests and actually that's how the plaintiffs got them. And if you take if you take Frederick Keenan and um, you know the city of Sunrise case, in all of those cases, if if you where the courts found that the statute of limitations and accrual of the cause of action is when the ordinance is passed, and it's four years from that, for someone who purchases land six or seven years later, who you know didn't have the notice at the time, they're still precluded from bringing cause of action, correct? That's right. And so our position is not as extreme as that here, because Ms. Conlon did purchase her property within that four-year period. She bought it in 2005. She had, under the Frederick theory, she had two years to file her challenge, and she didn't do that, just like the hundreds of other developers and other people who, who had paid <coughs> during those early years didn't bring the challenge. So what we is the relationship between the statute of limitations issue and the class certification order? I mean, we don't litigate affirmative defenses in class certification orders. The only issue before this court is the, the correctness of the order itself. Uh, well, if, assuming a class is certified, or if it's not, we'll have a chance to uh, file a summary judgment motion on statute of limitations and won't do it. Well, actually, we, we did do that. And it, it's ironic that the trial well, judge, in the same order, denied the motion for summary judgment, but, but at the same time. But I think it's pretty well established that you can't bootstrap one of an unappealable order on the back of an appealable that, that's order. That's correct. I mean, you can't do that. And so we're not we're suggesting that, Your Honor, review the summary judgment motion. <coughs> that really we're definitely doesn't not have asking very much that. to do with the uh, class certification order. I, I disagree. The, the class certification order has many pages dealing with these issues because the trial judge recognized that they were applicable to his reasoning to get to the standing issue. And we think that's the hook that this court can look at to, to address those issues. 
We're not asking for a summary judgment on statute of limitations. But and secondarily, we think that these issues do if, relate if that, to the definition correct. of I mean, class. I understand, I understand your argument, and it, you know, um, it hangs together. But here's the here's one concern I have about it. If that's if possible to do that, could you not take any affirmative defense that you had available and potentially could assert against the class representative and say, well, we're not really arguing about the defense. We're arguing about standing. Because if this defense were to prevail, and it should have prevailed, then the class representative doesn't have standing. We're not asking the court to go that far. And, and certainly, we're not raising a defense that goes to the actual merits, meaning the validity of the impact fees and the validity of the ordinance. So I think that's a distinction. But we think that the argument that we're making <coughs> is no different than the argument that was made in the Baptist Hospital versus Baker case, where, where this court reversed a class certification based upon a factual finding that the that the representative didn't have <coughs> cognizable damages. And we think that that our case is, is much neater from an appellate jurisdiction perspective than that one. And so we certainly think that, that our argument um, should be adopted on, on that basis. Counsel, you're you're in you've gone through your rebuttal time. Yes. I'm going to give you your two minutes for your rebuttal and we'll give an extra three minutes to uh, the appellee. Thank you. 